wireless medical robots inside our body. How tiny wireless robots can be used for non-invasive, precise and safe medical diagnosis and treatment. Met in City, Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. On November 9, 1989, I was a sophomore in Istanbul taking classes. My friends and I were so happy to hear that the Berlin Wall had finally come down. Hi everyone, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here and talk about our breakthrough. So today, I'll start with uh, a medical problem of a patient, and we have seen great examples of blindness and other, uh, of course, medical issues. But if you look at many diseases, like especially uh, when you get into any uh, complex brain-related diseases, for example, aneurysma or brain stroke, so they happen in different regions of the vasculature, and uh, especially if it happens in different areas, how can we save the patient's life? And we are talking about hours of operation that the patient needs to be saved in a day. So if you're lucky, half of the patients have the clot or the aneurysma in the areas where a catheter can access. So current golden standard is if you're lucky, the doctor or surgeon will get through uh, from your legs into your brain vasculature and try to pick the clot or close the aneurysma balloon so that uh, you can save the patient's life. So, but unfortunately, many patients cannot have this operation because they are, especially if they have these problems in the distal areas, then our solution as a technology to develop as a disruptive new medical device technology, can we make these devices wireless? Uh, because when you make wireless devices, like catheters are right now tethered, uh, we want to be minimally invasive like them, but then we want to get into much deeper, hard to reach and even uh, risky areas of the body sites. Brain is one of them, but there are many areas in our body we have the same risks and uh, access issues. And also the nice thing of being in wireless is we can implant the device in the body and stay there. So we have many breakthroughs recently, also cell-sized robots, which I will not talk today. So we deliver cancer drugs, even we can uh, deliver mRNA and, and many other cargoes precisely in the target area using robotic technology. But today I want to show you more other disruptive area we are working on in the sense of medical device technology is, can we make even mini-scale devices? And the answer is yes, and there has been indeed great uh, two decades of research ongoing. And when you look at the first robots designed in our field, they were all rigid, and, and this is the same this sort of robotics. If you look at ro robotic technology, everyone's images rigid robots. So that's how uh, also we started in the small-scale robotics, and they had these rigid legs, they were almost like a very scary, and they could penetrate tissue by spinning. And they typically had single function, and they had some safety issues. So innovation started like this. This is, again, of course, everything takes time. This was a decade ago. I told my student, look, we should change this concept. Why are the robots need to be rigid and scary? So can we make them soft and gentle and also more diverse behavior? And in this case, so this is a capsule you can sew off to your stomach with a camera on board. And now the idea is, can we make a shape changing and very simple shape change as a start? Can we make it just contract vertically? And yes, that's possible with a small magnet inside with the right flexible design. So external magnet controls the shape. So the idea here was, which was funded by NIH in US when I was there, so we entered the body by swallowing and got into the GI tract like stomach and then turned the shape into spherical one so we can stay in the stomach and deliver drugs and other cargoes for a long time for some severe patients. And when we are done, we change back the shape and get out naturally. So this was the first concept. And also we took the idea further by integrating a needle inside, and this robot, as you see, moves inside the GI tract by rolling uh, wirelessly with all electromagnets behind. There is a tracking system, knows exactly where the device and robot is going, and then in the right target area, we are applying the magnetic gradients to pull it, and then do multiple times under tissue biopsy for the first time. So this was the first time a fine needle biopsy of under tissue sample was taken from uh, any uh, pig animal in the case of, of course, the testing. So, but uh, that was a very just beginning of the story. Uh, I said, yeah, why don't we go and look at nature, how salt-bodied animals does do a lot of more amazing behavior. So this is, for example, a uh, uh, worm undulating. This uh, worm is walking and jumping. 
because of their salt body, they are very multifunctional. They can do safe and uh, interaction with us because when we interact, they are really soft and gentle and they can adapt uh, physically to many complex environments like inside our body. So with this motivation, uh, we proposed, can we make really robotic synthetic devices that have also wireless behavior and salt bodied locomotion and behavior? And uh, the first, in that sense, the major breakthrough we had was we could take an elastomeric sheet, basically, and program its magnetic properties in a complex way that we could induce different deformations, all enabled by external magnetic field control. The same robot can have all different modes. The only changing thing is the external field is applied in different direction and different magnitudes to give these modalities. Now, what can we do with this? Very simple modalities. Now we can make the robot rolling on the surface like a caterpillar, swimming like a spermozoite on water surface, and the same robot does this everything. The only thing changing is the external field. So it can go underwater. So in liquid field areas, it can swim like a jellyfish or like spermatozoid. It can use the body curvature to climb on water meniscus. That some water uh, beetles do that. And it can walk. And also when there is an obstacle in the body, it can also go into the U shape and then use elastic energy, stored energy to jump around. So this is like a creature that we created by these modalities. And of course, the soft body, as I mentioned, is very important. When you get into obstacles, for example, besides jumping, if you get into confined areas, like our body has full, many of them as vasculature and other areas, we can change the modes and, and keep going and moving. So that breakthrough changed our vision of how robots don't only just swim or fly or jump, but they can do all at the same time. And we took it further, more complexity-wise, rather than just an elastic sheet, which was, by the way, called WarmMate by New York Times journalists. We kept the name WarmMate. So now we turned the wrong WarmMate in different modalities and shapes. So jellyfish is the next one. That was another breakthrough for us, because in nature, these elegant swimmers, uh, at the baby's baby level, they are very small. This was the first time we used the same magnetic, soft, elastomeric material technology that we developed with external actuation the same morphology, same size scale, same behavior of a jellyfish we could replicate synthetically, robotically for the first time. And with this now, we can understand how these organisms swim efficiently. As you know, the nature is very sustainable. Energy consumption is really minimal. But it's not only about energy consumption and moving. They also need to get food. And now we understand with the robot how they get their food. And let me show how we use that as an advantage. By the motion of these legs, which are eight of them, like called leopards, they can trap food by fluidics control. Nothing about trapping like a gripper, but with the fluidics, we can now grab this drug and then deliver in the right place. And also, we can use the salt body to clog some channels in a controlled way. So here, I hope it will play, but <coughs> maybe it's not playing. Let me try again. So now, now we can go and clog also channels. Let's say if you don't want to have a baby, we can close your fallopian tube and stay there. And when you want it, we can get out again. So these are things becoming possible with this jellyfish-sized robots into, towards medical application. Another very interesting soft-bodied organism or actuation in our body is cilia. As you know, in our respiratory system and brain lobes, we have these cilia that moves our very vital fluids. And they have an amazing, again, coordinated, elegant uh, co behavior, which we call uh, metachronal waves. And for the first time, we could replicate these uh, cilia synthetically. And the important thing here is we're applying the uniform field of rotating field from outside. But each beam is designed differently so that they have different time response and time deformation so that they can coordinate. They are very working in a very coordinated manner to transport fluids and objects in, in wireless way. So this could solve some of the diseases in ciliary problems in the body. So going to the more medical device area, another recent breakthrough is we can now make 500 micron, even smaller, capsules where we can go and, for example, deliver a drug, again, or mRNA or other cargoes in a target location precisely on demand by controlled shape deformation from outside. In this case, we are delivering a drug in stomach. But also, the same device can have liquid biopsy. It can take liquids, and we can study and understand some diseases also. Now, coming back to the original patient idea, so I'd like to have a quick demonstration of we have a new device that is not even published yet. I hope I can make it work. 
So I replaced myself with a robot. So typically this is held by a robotic arm. And then the robot there is the, uh, this, uh, this black thing is indeed a small wireless robot. So basically what you do is you get close to it and try to spin the magnetic uh, field by rotating and then pulling this device into the vasculature. And you can see that this device is indeed moving precisely and we can do it backward and forward. And uh, basically this way, uh, we can have a precise control on where it goes in the vasculature. So this is a new device that we just created. And uh, so the idea here is again, if you have an aneurysma, uh, let me show you in the uh, video itself. When we spin and move the uh, magnetic field with the robotic arm precisely, this is where aneurysma is. So the virus device is moving in the blood vessel. In this case, of course, a replica of that. And then when we get to the aneurysma area, we can basically come here and the robot has a skin. And then when the blood is moving here by the dying, you can see that now the blood never reaches to this uh, area so that we can save the patient by basically creating a wireless stent that can go precisely in the vascular system and reach the target problematic area. So these are all possible these days or becoming possible. Of course, there are still a lot of scientific challenges to translate uh, these technologies into clinics. But uh, what we believe is these wireless devices will have a huge impact or a very disruptive impact on medicine and healthcare. First of all, uh, our goal is to improve quality of life of patients that we will have more minimally invasive technologies with minimal side effects. We saw that many drugs and uh, even the vaccines don't reach the target and we have really not so efficient systems most of the time. And that's why we want to improve that by local delivery of drugs to the target. That will also help the recovery of the patients much faster. And also, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are some patients really we cannot save them at all. They die because of um, uh, inoperable problems or during the surgery they get so much damage into their brain and other areas, they will have basically a very uh, miserable life afterwards. So that's really one of the other goals. And finally, our dream is to leave these devices inside your body and monitor what's happening and then try to understand when the disease happens and then solve it at the point. And even if it repeats again, we want to repeat the, both diagnosis but also treatment of the given disease. Thank you very much.